Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you. And for those who have been joining us over the weeks, we welcome you back. Um, my name is Nolutando Nematsperani, and on behalf of uh, uh, SAMA, UFFP, and SAPBF, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, webinar. Um, we'll be discussing an interesting topic where our head actuary from Discovery, uh, Mr. Emil Stipp, will be taking us through um, the numbers, uh, the data and the trends for COVID-19 and trying to make sense of these numbers. Just some house rules before we start. Uh, this webinar is CPD accredited. Uh, you will get uh, the certificates uh, in about a week's time. Um, and if you want to query anything, you can send these to cpd at discovery.co.za. Uh, all webinars are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. Please uh, feel free to ask questions th throughout the webinar. We'll try and collect these uh, in themes and uh, we will ask Emil uh, you know, at the end of his presentation. Uh, please use the Q&A button and not the chat button um, and we will make sure that we attend to all your questions. Please look out uh, for the poll at the end of the talk um, yeah, so we would really uh, appreciate you giving us some feedback in terms of how you have experienced. Now, introducing uh, tonight's guest, uh, who is, uh, well, a, a chief actuary at Discovery. He is joining us uh, all the way from the UK. Uh, he is uh, our chief actuary who has uh, 25 years actuarial experience. Um, he was uh, previously um, at Deloitte, but he joined Discovery Health in 2007, and he's been responsible for the health, health actuarial work within the Discovery Group in South Africa and internationally, as you are aware that he is now um, in the UK. Emil uh, was the convener of the Actuarial Society, um, uh, South Africa's healthcare committee from 2003 to 2007, and also served on the AIDS Committee and Short-Term Insurance Committee of the Society. He was elected in 2007 to the Council of the Actuarial Society of South Africa and held this position until 2010. He has been a member of the Board of Examiners um, of the Actuarial Society since 2007 and was appointed Chair of the Board in 2010. In 2014, the Actuarial Society awarded him the Murray, the Murray Medal, the highest award of the profession in recognition of his contribution to the profession. In May 2008, Emil was elected as chairman of the health section of the International Actuarial Association and held that position until 2014. From 2013 to 2016, he was the first chairman of the health committee of the International Actuarial Association. In addition, since July 2017, he acts as chief actuary of Vitality Health in the UK, and he now spends half his time in London. He takes overall responsibility for Discovery's big data strategy and development of that strategy in South Africa and the UK. So as you can see, he is the best person uh, to talk to us uh, about numbers. I'm going to hand over to Emil to take us through, uh, you know, the data and the trends uh, regarding uh, COVID-19, and we will get an opportunity to engage with him in terms of our questions as we move along. Thank you, Emil. I would like to hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Nole. Thanks for the, thanks for the introduction. Um, and welcome everybody to um, to London. Um, as Nolu has said, I'm uh, I'm speaking to you from here. Uh, I usually fly up and down and spend two weeks in South Africa, two weeks in London, but I've been uh, in lockdown in the UK. Um, and uh, I must say, it has been a very a very strange experience uh, to uh, to go through COVID-19 here. I think what the UK experienced in about uh, early April is basically the stage where South Africa is now. So what I'd like to do today is to take you through um, what we expect to happen with COVID-19. Um, there's a lot of uncertainties and I'll highlight some of those to you, um, but I hope that you can also just get a sense um, of how we're interpreting the data that's emerging internationally and trying to make sense of it all. So I'll start just by talking very briefly about previous uh, pandemics. Um, it is something that the world has faced many times. It's one of the things that has changed human history in many ways. 
Um, and the one pandemic that is uh, that is very much top of mind when one thinks about COVID is the um, Spanish flu. So 1918, um, at the, the end of the First World War, um, it infected 500 million people, which at that point was about 25% of the global population. Um, they don't quite know, but they estimate that uh, there were between 17 and 50 million deaths at that time. And I think it was exacerbated a lot just by people moving across the world as a result of the end of the First World War. Um, and it's often called the Spanish flu. Um, and the reason for that is that actually um, military censuses in the UK and in the USA and France and Germany initially downplayed it. But in Spain, they were more honest and open about the effects of this. As a result of that, it got that name. Um, and it was caused basically by swine flu. Now, the interesting thing about this pandemic is that it had a very unusual mortality curve. So typically in influenza, we have the, the sort of U-shaped curve that you see, see on the left of the, of the screen there, where infants have a, a high an elevated mortality rate and older people tend to, tend to die. But in 1918, actually, the shape was a W shape. Um, and it was particularly devastating because there were so many people, young people who died as a result um, of the pandemic. Um, and there's some really interesting research that uh, I've seen now published in more than one paper uh, where they tried to address the question of why did death peak at age 28 in the 1918 pandemic. And what's interesting about it is that they figured out 28 years before 1918, uh, what happened then is that there was a seasonal bird flu. And what seems to be the pattern is that the flu that you are first exposed to in the year of your birth, you basically have elevated um, immunity or, or some degree of immunity against that basically for the rest of your life. Because this was a swine flu epidemic, it particularly hit uh, people who were born in the year when they were first exposed to bird, bird flu and they had no immunity against swine flu. It hit them particularly hard. And that's why you see that pattern uh, for this pandemic. What's also quite interesting about it is that on the 10th of August in 1918, in the UK, in London, they actually declared victory over Spanish flu. They said it's all over um, and we've basically, we've conquered this. Um, and then uh, that was in summer. And then in that winter, um, the UK was hit really, really hard by the pandemic. pandemic. It really came back with a big vengeance. Um, and I think we see parallels with that also in the world where, where currently people are thinking COVID is over and then it emerges again, as we saw in Melbourne um, this week. Now, the other, the other pandemic, which you know, all of you will be very familiar with, uh, that, we, that we've had to do, deal with is HIV and AIDS. You can see there how the number of new infections, uh, a number of people in total infected, you can just multiply that by 10 on the, on the uh, y-axis has changed over time of course there's no vaccine for for HIV and AIDS um, if you get it basically the way that it that the world lives with it now is that it's treatable it's treatable as almost like any other chronic disease but having said all of that still by the by the end of 2020 39 million people would have died because of HIV you can see in 1986 dr. Fauci who's now on the news every week um, also played a very strong role um, in making the world aware of HIV and warning the world basically that there's a big uh, epidemic coming. But in 1994, with Dr. David Ho um, basically proving that combination therapy is effective, since then treatment has, has uh, improved. Um, at the moment, still in the US, for instance, there's close to 40,000 people every year infected with HIV. So th this pandemic is by no means over. The only thing is that it is treatable. So when we think about COVID also, um, what we're all hoping for is a vaccine. Um, what might happen is just that it is treatable or that it eventually becomes treatable. But I think the better solution for all of us would be if there is a vaccine that is effective um, against it. So let's talk a little bit about COVID. Um, now, what you have on the screen here is basically the attack rate. So this is the number of new infections per 100,000 population per day. It's a seven day moving average. And if you look there, you can see South Africa as the sort of thick blue line and how that has increased. 
And what is interesting about this graph is if you look at the European countries, uh, which is more on the left-hand side of the graph, you can see that the level at which they peaked um, is quite lower than what we have currently in South Africa, also lower than uh, Brazil and in Chile. And what seems to be emerging in this, in this epidemic or in the pandemic is that there's quite a different tra trajectory for the, um, developed countries and developing countries. And the one exception to that is the United States. And I'll talk a little bit about the United States and what is, what is happening there at the moment. But South Africa's curve overall hides the effect of what's happening at province level. So you can see the Western Cape curve there. We, we show it in the, in the graph in a sort of a thick orange line. But if you look at all of the provinces, this is basically what's happening right at the moment. So initially when we saw the increase in the Western Cape, there's a lot of questions about whether there's something unique in the Western Cape. Um, but when we looked at the numbers, we saw that actually it's just a matter of a delay. So it's just a matter of time until it spreads to the rest of the provinces. And that's what we're seeing exactly happening right now. So certainly in the Eastern Cape and in Gauteng, we see numbers rising uh, rapidly. Um, and I think it is wise to expect that that would happen in the other provinces as well going forward. Um, so this is where we are in terms of infections right now at the moment. Um, but what I'd like to talk about is just what we expect to happen from this point onwards and how we're thinking about the development of the epidemic from this point onwards. Now, I think in doing so, um, probably at the end of all of this, when we, when we look back at it, there will be two important dates in COVID-19. And the first of it is 20th of January, 2020. That was when the first case was reported in South Korea. What's interesting about that date is what happened one day later, which is on 21st of January, the first case was reported in the United States of America. Now, when we look at what, where we stand right now, so this is data from the 8th of July, official government reported statistics. Of course, some people estimate that, that the true numbers are higher, but that's not the case for South Korea. On the 8th of July, 2020, in South Korea, they had just over 13,000 reported cases and 287 deaths. And I think I don't need to tell you that in the United States, um, they crossed the 3 million mark with 132,000 deaths um, as of yesterday. Um, and when you think about it, there's no real reason why this should be the case. It's not as if socioeconomic conditions are very different, um, not necessarily as if uh, there's overcrowding or different living conditions. These are both two developed countries. And literally, the only difference between them is the political response. And in South Korea, what happened is right from the word go, when this emerged, the government took it seriously. Um, they implemented contact tracing. And as a result of that, they've been able to control the epidemic. In the USA, they waited six weeks before going into lockdown. And they're paying the price now also for lifting lockdown too early. So I think what governments do has a major impact on how the disease develops. Um, and it will be very clear at the end of all of this that that's the case. I'll talk a little bit about also whether South Africa went into lockdown too early. And my view is that uh, that's not the case. So when you look at lockdowns, um, uh, and I'm comparing here, for instance, South Africa against the UK, um, both of those is, uh, you know, I'm basically experiencing. Um, I think what we can tell from it is that lockdowns do work in the sense that they slow down the transmission rate or the, or the reproduction rate of the epidemic. And that buys time. We'll talk about herd immunity and what it means as well a little bit later on. But what we can see from both these countries' experience is also the longer a lockdown lasts, the more effective it is, the more intense it is, the more effective it is. In the UK in particular, in the first, very early on, they said, okay, we, we're just going to, we keep London open, but we're going to ban large gatherings. That didn't actually make a big difference. It was only until we went into lockdown in the UK um, that it started to have a real effect. The earlier a lockdown is implemented, the better. Now there, the UK didn't do very well because here they also waited about four weeks before doing it, but South Africa did a lockdown much earlier. As a result of that, the effects of the, of the epidemic were postponed. Um, but there's other factors that also play a role. So the season, the fact that, uh, that uh, we're in winter now in South Africa, but in summer in the UK, I think that does make some difference, not a very huge difference, but some difference. Healthcare system capacity, the quality of care provided, 
And poverty and inequality is also important, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you some statistics on that. With both of the of uh, South Africa and the and the UK, unfortunately, we're in a position where lockdown is lifted in less than ideal conditions. So the rate of new infections is not stabilised yet, especially for South Africa. Um, in the UK, that is more the case. But testing is not available to large number of peoples, and there's also no contact tracing, neither in the UK nor in South Africa. And that actually does make a difference. So when we look at the data internationally, if uh, what I'm showing there is case fatality rates, um, and basically the data from a variety of countries and how it's changing per day. Um, and you can see basically the countries have very different experience. And the main reason for that, obviously, is that you're talking about total deaths divided by total reported cases. And the reported cases depend on the availability of testing. So the denominator changes for different countries. And that's why you get, if you look on the right-hand side, quite different statistics emerging from different countries. So in the UK, the case fatality rate is 15.5%. In South Africa, 1.6%. South Korea, 22 You can see all the different numbers there. So the question is just, how do we make sense of all of these numbers? So the one way to do it is to say that the deaths that we observe today is a function of the total number of infections we had a number of days ago. So it takes a few weeks, probably up to about three weeks on average between the time that somebody's infected um, and when they will die. So if you, test, if you take the same data and you apply different lags to it, um, what is interesting about this is that also in some countries still the numbers are quite volatile. You can see it moving all over the screen there. But what I, what I have highlighted there is in the thick blue line is South Korea's experience. And you can see that basically they've kept it fairly constant all the way through. And the reason for that is that they implemented early social distancing. They used contact tracing using mobile phones. So everybody in South Korea was forced to participate in this, and everybody who came into contact with somebody who tested positive, that person was basically taken out of their homes, put in isolation until it was confirmed that they are not COVID positive or until they treated and recovered from that. And that's the way that they managed it and how they managed to now, at this point, still have only 287 deaths as a result of COVID. Of course, there's still local outbreaks. So even in Australia and New Zealand, COVID has not gone away, but the way in which that's managed meant that they basically still have the disease under control. In other countries, that is not the case, and also there's no ubiquitous testing, and also there's no contact tracing. And as a result of that, these countries find it much harder uh, to manage the epidemic. So um, what we know from COVID uh, and, and the mortality rates, uh, this was basically published by Imperial College um, already, I think it was uh, roughly halfway through April, they revised their infection fatality rates, estimated infection fatality rates. And what you can see there is that on the left-hand side, it's certainly very much a very sharp difference by age. And the older you are, the more you are at risk. Um, in the middle, that's uh, early data from Italy that basically shows the more comorbidities you have, the higher your risk, um, and that's been confirmed by a lot of data so, since then. I'll also show you some of our discovery data. Um, but if you follow the, the infection fatality rate on the left-hand side, based on the national population age distribution, you can estimate different expected mortality rates or infection fatality rates for different countries. And the one thing that you can see there is obviously in the developed world, uh, in most countries, populations are older. Um, so in Spain and Italy, you find that the expected IFR is 1.4, 1.2%. In the UK, 1.1%. South Africa's is quite a bit lower. It's actually 0.39%. So we would expect a, a, a lower number of people to die in South Africa just because we are younger in South Africa than the rest of the world. Now, I'm going to talk about the IFR because I think things are changing, and I'll share you some data also that we're observing. I think it is coming down, um, and that also has some implication for how we interpret the numbers. So I'm going to give you just an example of now how we developed an understanding of what's happening in different countries. This is using old data, and things are changing now, So, but I think it still gives a sense of basically just how, how we interpreted the numbers emerging from different countries. So if you recall, what we said is that Imperial College estimated that the IFO, or the mortality applied to the UK age distribution is 1.1%. So this of all the people getting COVID, 
1.1% of people would die. So on the 5th of May, for instance, the reported number of, of deaths in the UK was 28,000. Now that number in itself is controversial because that only includes deaths in um, hospitals. Um, and there was some adjustment for the figures, but there were also a whole lot of people who died in care homes, and that's not included in that number. The true death rate, true infection rate is a bit higher. But in this presentation, what I've done is just to use official statistics, not to bring any subjectivity into it. So if you take that number and you basically divide by 1.1%, then what you can derive is that you would expect to have had 2.6 million people infected X days ago. So the question is, what is X? So the way that we estimated this is to look at this data over a few weeks and then to say, if we use X of five days or 10 days or 15 or 20 days, um, at what point do we get a smooth curve and relatively reliable predictions of what deaths we, sh we should expect um, in future weeks and then does it track that? So we aim to derive a smooth curve and what we found for the UK is that we have to use seven days. Um, and if you were to do that, then you say that, okay, so there's 2.6 million people infected seven days before. And if you use the seven day uh, period, effectively you can say that on the 5th of May, the reported dates, uh, the number of cases in the UK, or the, or the reported number of cases in the UK seven days before the 5th of May was 157K. We know already how many people um, uh, we estimate to be infected, that's 2.6 million. And that means that the extent of underreporting is 60 and a half times in the UK. Now that number has stayed fairly constant. So when we apply this to the, to the data emerging in the UK, we can see that that gives us a fairly reliable estimate of the number of deaths that we're observing in the population. So just for interest, in South Africa, the factor is about 10. In the US, it's about seven and a half. It's different in every country, depending on their testing protocols and availability of testing. So what that means is that if then on the 5th of May, you observe 187,000 deaths uh, the, or the infections, then the true infection on the 5th of May is roughly 3.1 million. And what that means is that seven days later, on the 12th of May, you should expect 34,000 deaths. What we actually had then was 32,000, just over 32,000. Um, and effectively, um, at that point already, the epidemic was starting to decrease in the UK, and hence it was slightly overestimating. But it still gave us a reasonable um, number. So if we apply that then to different countries, and we, we work out this, this factor of underreporting in every country, what I have on the screen here is what it basically means in terms of the total number of reported infections in each of these countries right now. So in the UK currently, the total number of reported infections on 9 July is 287,000. Total population size is 67 million. So using this methodology, we can estimate then that actually the true infection rate is 7.1%. The important thing about that is that it means that there's 92.9% .9 of people that still have not been infected. In other words, 62 million people that are effectively still vulnerable to infection. And for Spain, you can work out the same numbers. You get 5.4% um, infected. In the United States, it's now close to 7%. And in South Africa, 4%. So the bottom line of this is basically that it's still critical to control the epidemic in all countries. Um, and what's interesting about it is that when antibody tests have been done, um, and the more reliable antibody tests from Roche recently have certainly expanded our knowledge on this, what they found is actually that it was reported in the UK, I think it's now about three or four weeks ago, that it was estimated to be 5.8%. What this methodology gave us at the time was about five and a half. So it's in the ballpark figure. And there's nothing in the world that indicates that currently everybody has been infected or a lot of people have been infected, which means that we have not yet achieved herd immunity in any country in the world. So let's talk a little bit about herd immunity. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through a few formula at the moment. Um, and I think with this audience, uh, hopefully all of you will follow this. But effectively, um, any, any epidemic basically follows a similar pattern. It goes up to herd immunity, the susceptible population at that point um, starts decreasing. So as more and more people get COVID um, and they don't get infected again, or well, they have immunity against reinfection, that means the susceptible population decreases, and that means that at some point, the infections go down. 
there is speculation about whether for how long, if you've had COVID, for how long you have immunity. We don't know yet because, uh, you know, the epidemic is still fairly new in most countries in the world. What we are assuming in all of these projections is that it does at least give you immunity for about a year. That does seem to be the case with other coronaviruses. We're hoping that it would be at least that um, also. um, And it's important for how it develops from this point onwards. So this is basically the the formula that is behind any um, of these SEIR models um, that's used by epidemiologists. Um, SEIR stands for Susceptible, Exposed, Infected, and Recovered. Um, And what you have there in that equation, it's basically the the derivative of of infections as a proportion of um, of the population, so how it changes over time. You can see that that's the growth rate in active active cases multiplied by the number of people who were infected in the previous day, multiplied by the population that's still susceptible, divided by the total population, minus the recovery rate. It's recovery or death. It's basically saying that when people um, are not in the population anymore to be infected and they effectively recovered, and that's also recovery rate uh, times the, the, the population the previous day. So what we can do is to say that at what point does this curve start flattening off? So that's when that derivative reaches zero. Um, so you can just put zero on the left-hand side of that equation and do, do a little bit of maths by um, saying that the, the reproduction rate is effectively the growth rate divided by the recovery rate. If you substitute that, you do a little bit of maths, then you can see that one divided by the reproduction rate is equal to the proportion of the susceptible population at that point. And hence, the percentage of the population already infected at that point of herd immunity is one minus the proportion susceptible. They've already been infected. And if you do the algebra, what you can see is that the herd immunity threshold is equal to the reproduction rate minus one divided by the reproduction rate. Now, why am I telling you all of this, all of this maths, is because it has a real and very dramatic impact on what happens on the ground. So what we're saying is that the reproduction rate Um, You can see in this graph, in this table on the left-hand side, let's say it's 1.5. So what that means is that for every person infected, over, say, the three weeks that they are infectious and that they can pass the virus on to other people, every person on average will will infect one and a half other people. So every three people will infect two people. So that means that the turning point of the epidemic, where it reaches its maximum, is at 33% of the population. That's the herd immunity threshold. Then thereafter, it goes down. By the time that it reaches zero, it would have infected 58% of people. So if you multiply that out by the number by the infection fatality rate, if that's the case, if the, if the reproduction rate throughout the whole epidemic is on average one and a half, what you would find in the UK is that 427,000 people would die, and in South Africa, 130,000. If instead it is two, so every person who gets infected infects two other people, you can see that the turning point is much higher. It's at half of the population. Total infections go down at 80%. Um, And then what you would find is mortality in the UK turns out to be 560,000, in South Africa, 180,000. That difference is mainly attributable to age. The point about this is in the absence of a vaccine or effective treatment, keeping the reproduction rate as low as possible saves many lives. And if you like, what I've shown you here is the mathematical proof of why people should wear masks, why you should social distance. And if only politicians believed in mass, then maybe the world would have a much better outcome, particularly in some other countries in the world. But I think this is sort of a fundamental principle. So when we look at the projections of COVID, we, we place a lot of emphasis on RT. Unfortunately, of course, the RT is not a constant number, and I'll show you some numbers on that. So this is RTs for various countries. It's estimated by Imperial College. Um, what they do is to derive this off the death statistics because that's the most reliable statistics that they get out of different countries. And what you see on the screen there is the, is the weekly um, RT reported in different countries. So with the UK, um, what you can see is the yellow line. 
Um, other than in the early weeks of May, it was basically below one for many weeks now. What that means is that the epidemic is contracting. So every person infects less than one other person. And that means that the epidemic is spreading at a slower rate and it's shrinking. Uh, when you look at Sweden, for instance, it's a, it's a famous example because they never went into lockdown. They decided that they will aim for herd immunity. They have effectively, through voluntary social distancing, they have brought down um, the RT. And you can see that it has been below one for, for many of these weeks, but it started off at a high level. And Sweden paid the price for that. So there's close to 6,000 people dead in Sweden out of 10 million. Whereas when you look at Norway, um, and Finland and Denmark, countries around them that went into lockdown, it's a few hundred people that died um, as a result of COVID. Brazil also started at a much higher level. There's a lot of political resistance to it, but also it's a developing country, so it spreads much faster. But I think what's happening there is also that people's behavior changes over time and hence the RT comes down. So when we look at the green line, this is South Africa's statistics, um, initially, we were quite concerned. A few weeks ago, we were really concerned that it was that it was well above one and a half and trending to the to, to the higher levels. It has come down since then. Unfortunately, now from three weeks ago, it has been creeping up again. So I think, unfortunately, the RT is not a particularly stable number, um, but still, what it helps us to do is just to, to get a sense of what the epidemic is doing in the population. Now, I spoke about the, about the IFR and this question of whether we went into lockdown too early in South Africa. And um, my personal view, I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, is that actually that's not the case at all. Um, and when we look at discovery statistics, so this is our own numbers of the number of people admitted to hospital for COVID. Um, of those people, some go to ICU, some get admitted to ICU. And then we observe out of completed ICU cases, how many people recovered and how many people died. And what you can see there up to about this, the first, second week of June, it was roughly 80% of people admitted to ICU dying as a result of COVID, but it has been steadily decreasing since then. And we looked at it and that was roughly the time at which it was publicized that uh, dexamethasone for acute severe cases, oral steroids for mild cases, and these alternatives to early ventilation, such as prone positioning, high flow oxygen, that became well known in the medical community. I think many doctors um, adopted some of these things earlier on, but I think what we can observe in the data is that's now become standard medical treatment. As a result of that, we see about a 23% reduction in the infection fatality rate already in the data. So what we will certainly do in our numbers going forward and in our projections, we will reduce the IFR. The problem with that is because this graph on the, on the reproduction rate is derived off death statistics, what it means is that this uptick in South Africa in the green line basically means that we have, if we have a lower IFR, it means that we actually have a higher reproduction rate. So the numbers that I'll show you today does not assume that the IFR reduces um, because you'd have to make an adjustment at the same time and push up the reproduction rate. Um, but what I'll show you today, it's more or less, it will be more or less the same, but probably a little bit higher as a result of a higher RT once, once we make these adjustments. Um, because the RT basically then means that, we sp that it spreads more through the population. But I think the bottom line here is that Basically, for everybody that gets infected, we already have a 23% reduction in the mortality rate. And that is because we could observe basically what's happening in the rest of the world, adopt medical treatment, change it as the treatments develop. So the longer we postpone the epidemic, basically the more lives we save. So as you'll see from the numbers that I'll present to you just now, uh, if you take all of these numbers and you take 23% off, we save a huge number of lives. And that's why I don't think that South Africa went into lockdown too early. So modeling COVID-19, what we've done here is basically to assume different RTs or different reproduction rates. Um, it is very hard, even as we sit here today, to say how will this now play out over the next year. Um, but I think what you can take from these scenarios that we demonstrate is, one, that it is very important to keep the reproduction rate down. 
two is that there are many different many different scenarios that could still play out, and three, I guess, is that the timing of these things will be different depending on what the underlying reproduction rate is. So this is basically the number of infections that we'd have under these different scenarios. So um, on this graph, we have a runaway scenario that's sort of purple line, where we assume that the RT is effectively close to, uh, it's about 1.7. Um, under the medium line, which is the yellow one, the medium scenario, we're using that for our internal planning discovery. Uh, we're basically saying that the RT basically remains at about 1.25 slightly lower in, in summer and then going up in winter again. As a result of that, you can see on the screen there that you get very different numbers. So total number of infections then um, on the medium scenario and the yellow line by the end of all of this, at the end of next year, uh, will be um, it's roughly just over 17 million people. But on the runaway scenario, we basically have 40 million people infected. On the right-hand side, you can see incremental. So this is daily new infections. Under a runaway scenario at its peak, uh, which will happen then roughly in the first week of September, what you would find is that there will be 500,000 new infections on that day, and then thereafter it comes down. So th the thing to note about that incremental curve is basically that the more severe the epidemic is, the shorter it is. So if it's a severe epidemic, basically by um, February, roughly, it would all be over, have all have herd immunity, and effectively the epidemic is done then. Under the lower scenarios, it's much more of a slower burn, but fewer people are infected, and as a result of that, fewer people die as well. So what you can see here is what the cumulative deaths are on the left-hand side under these different scenarios and the incremental deaths on the right-hand side. And this is what it works out in terms of the numbers. So under a low scenario, then we're expecting in total 25,000 people to have died. Under a medium scenario, 64,000. You can see there it goes up to little control and runaway scenarios of up to about 150,000 people. What I'm really hoping is that we can avoid the numbers on the right-hand side of this table and be far more to the left-hand side. Whether we achieve that will basically depend on the extent to which people practice social distancing, the extent to which we avoid the reproduction rate of going up. Now, when we look at provincial deaths, um, it does become even harder to predict things, um, simply because uh, these things are far less stable at provincial level. Um, the Western Cape certainly had the epidemic earlier than the other provinces, um, but Gauteng is now getting a much bigger increase. This graph is a, is a logarithmic Y scale, so that's why all the numbers seem to be a pretty straight line, but you can see the orange line there in Gauteng basically just how it's increasing very rapidly, whereas the Western Cape is flattening off. If we use a normal scale on the left-hand side, a normal Y scale again, you can see that whilst the Western Cape in terms of total numbers are still higher, in Gauteng we see a very definite uptick. I don't know whether we're getting these predictions right. I think there will be some overs and unders by provinces. The national predictions are probably a bit more reliable. But even so, there's a lot of uncertainty remaining. Um, and Gauteng and the rate at which, at which it's rising at the moment is certainly uh, a big cause for concern. So when we look at the, the private sector and we apply these reproduction rates and these scenarios to all of the people who are insured in private medical schemes, what we did here is just to look at private sector general ward hospital bed requirements. There's a lot of assumptions behind that, but we're basically taking the national scenarios, applying it to the medical scheme population, which is older than the, than the national population on average, um, and then just saying, do we have enough hospital beds available to deal with COVID? So at a national level, in theory, there are enough hospital beds available in general wards, even under the very severe scenarios. However, this doesn't say that at a local level, whether in Santon or in uh, you know, Alberton, there would be a lot, enough beds available for the cases happening at that point at that time. We're just looking here at overall. And also, it doesn't assume that there's any public sector hospitals coming to private hospitals. And that, of course, we know will happen in practice. For ICU, though, things are a bit more tight. So there you can see already um, under the runaway scenario, we do breach um, effectively those requirements, those sort of available beds under the runaway scenario. 
Under the medium scenario on both of these graphs, nationally, there should be enough beds available. Um, however, that also depends then on how many public sector patients enter into private hospitals. So that's just at a high level. I think what we will have to do is obviously to refine it in a lot of detail um, and look at what's happening all the time in the data that we get um, from, the, from the healthcare sector. I want to end off just talking very briefly about what we're seeing in the data on individual risk factors. Um, and there was a very good study done by the NHS in the UK, basically looking at health records of 17 million adults. And at that point, it was based on 5,700 deaths. Um, uh, so it's a pretty big study. And what they showed in this is that definitely death from COVID-19 was strongly associated with being male, having a higher BMI, um, so older age and deprivation, uncontrolled diabetes, severe asthma, and various other prior medical conditions. Um, they also looked at race and they saw some differences. Um, and um, the study did not find interesting that hypertension was a, was a factor um, adjusting for all other factors. But what was interesting about this um, is when you look at, uh, at BMI, um, the hazard ratios on the, are on the right-hand side there, fully adjusted for all other risk factors. We can certainly see that BMI has a role, to, uh, has a role in the risk of death. Um, and that interested us because, as you know, through vitality, uh, we do have a sense of people's BMI. We also have a sense of how much they exercise. So when we applied this to our own data, this knowledge, and tried to just look at the data, um, what we found in South, in South Africa as well, um, this is our, our discovery, our discovery, our data discovery, is that the extent to which people exercise, which is the vitality engagement metric, that's the VEM metric that we use here, does seem to be an indicator of their risk of admission. So at this point, we still don't have enough deaths in South Africa to have a reliable model. Um, we have first versions of the model, and what it indicates is that these curves are even steeper than admission curves. But we see both in South Africa and in the UK that the healthier your lifestyle, regardless of your age, um, regardless of chronic conditions, the more you exercise, the more you reduce your risk. And I think that is one thing that basically everybody can bear in mind, and we see it very clearly emerging out of the data. The other thing that, uh, that the UK study that did show is that deprivation has a significant impact also on risk. So you can see again on the right-hand side of your screen there, the fully adjusted risk factors for different quintiles of socioeconomic status. Uh, so the least deprived in quintile one, um, their risk relative to people that are most deprived. And you can see there how it's basically increasing risk by 75% of death. And I think that is what we're seeing in terms of developing na nations versus developed nations, how it is playing out. So here in the UK, it's possible for people to um, work from home, uh, to socially distance, they have space around them, uh, they have good health care, they tend to exercise more, all of those sort of things play a role. And hence, in the developed world, we do expect the impact of the epidemic to be less than what you have in countries where there's high degrees of inequality and where living conditions um, are poorer. So basically what we can say, if I can make a few concluding remarks, is that most of the world is still vulnerable to infection. For that reason, it is still very important to keep the reproduction rate as low as possible. It's prudent in South Africa now to expect a severe epidemic. Um, I must qualify this by saying that there are still a large number of things that we don't know about it. There may be, it, it might be the case that there are some proportion of the population that's just not susceptible um, to COVID-19. We don't see evidence of that yet, but still we don't know everything yet. It's still a new disease and it's still playing out as we speak. And that might still have an impact later on. But for now, I think what we should do is all expect it to be a severe epidemic. And for that reason, try and keep the reproduction rate as low as possible. Until there is a vaccine or treatment also, we will have to live with COVID-19 and we'll have to manage the risk of outbreaks. But what that implies is that it has economic consequences. I think the way that things are playing out now, when there is a lot of community transmission, as we have in South Africa, it's basically impossible to control the epidemic through another lockdown. 
I think also that local lockdowns don't make a lot of sense to me because you can't have a border around the local area. So even here in the UK and Leicester, there was a recent lockdown. Um, and of course, all the newspapers go there and they, they take a picture of the street, which is the one side of the street in lockdown, the other side of the street is not in lockdown. So unless you can avoid people from actually walking across the street, it's very hard to enforce local lockdowns. You also need a lot of police to do so. And I think all of those things are very hard in South Africa. So I think the best thing that we can do is basically to tell everybody how important it is to carry on social distancing, wash their hands, make sure that they, that they try and avoid being in buildings with other people, um, avoid large gatherings. Probably one of the most dangerous things that you can do is to sing together. So I really don't think that people should sing in church. Uh, that's one of the things that, uh, that does come out in these studies. There's a whole lot of things that we can learn from international statistics that will help us to manage it in South Africa. But I think we are in for the long haul in South Africa as the way things stand at the moment. And it's up to all of us to try and manage it as best as we can. So I hope that was interesting. And all there, I'll hand, hand back to you. So if there are any questions, uh, let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emil. That was really uh, very insightful. Um, we have a few questions. I think for me, uh, what was quite interesting because one of the first questions was, was around head immunity. I think you really uh, unpacked it very well that uh, it comes at a cost. And I think all the countries that thought they would go that route, uh, they, you know, along the way you do lose lives to actually get uh, to that point. I think maybe uh, just looking um, at, 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 you know, the recent, um, uh, you know, uh, I think the recent publications around airborne transmission of, 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 of uh, uh, COVID, uh, how would that uh, impact your numbers? Just thinking about an, the, the airborne transmission that, you know, has been in the, in the news uh, recently. Yeah, I think that that gets back to, to basically the extent to which people do social distancing. So, so I think the airborne nature of the disease, it's already in the numbers. That is basically what we're observing. And particularly, I think the US is probably the best example of that. What we're seeing in terms of the infections there now is probably as a result of coming out of lockdown too early, a whole lot of process, protests happening a few weeks ago infections are there now, the deaths will follow. So if mm -hmm. you see in the FT today, there was an article already, uh, either the FT or the New York Times on how the deaths are increasing in the US. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a, the, the, I have spoken to some epidemi epidemiologists who have the view that with coronaviruses in general, the longer they last, the less vir virulent they become. So typically they become less harmful over time. Um, but I think we still need to see quite a lot of evidence for that. On the positive side, at least the treatment is improving, so that will also bring the death rate down. But I think in terms of airborne infection, that's already, it's in the numbers. So I think what's important for people to bear in mind is not to be in buildings together with other people, to avoid that as far as you can, because it does seem to linger inside especially. But when you're outside, I think the risks are much lower. Yeah. I think it's very important because when people read some of those things, you know, they think suddenly now, um, you know, the reproductive rate is going to be different and everything else. And therefore, the precautionary measures that are already in place, uh, I think we must emphasize that they are still, you know, um, good enough, even in, in instances where there is some degree of airborne transmission. Uh, the other important one um, question, uh, maybe, or a comment, uh, Emil, is around uh, the changing uh, testing strategy for South Africa. I think we know that in the UK, um, you know, at some point, if for most of the time, you know, it was uh, limited to people who were hospitalized, um, meaning that uh, the, the majority of people who were mildly symptomatic were not getting tested, and therefore, the reporting in terms of the cases. So we're seeing. Uh, you know, deaths, uh, you know, if you look at your denominator, it was made up of people who were very sick um, and therefore, which is slightly different to how we have been, you know, testing. But I think with priority testing in South Africa being introduced, where we are going to see more uh, of the hospitalized or, you know, pre-admission testing, um, it's going to skew our numbers uh, a bit. Any comments on that? Yeah, 
Yes, yeah, that, I mean, that is one of the, the sort of central difficulties of interpreting all of this is, uh, is how testing changes over time. In the initial stages um, of, of the epidemic in South Africa, there's, there's one important ratio, which I think, which I don't have time to deal with. But if you look at everybody that gets tested and you take the ratio of those that test positive as a percentage of the total tests on a particular day, um, the countries that have managed COVID well have kept that ratio below 3%. Mm-hmm. And South Africa initially was one of those countries. We did enough testing to be able to say that, you know, the majority of people that we're testing are not positive. At the moment, when we measure it, it's about 23%. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, we are not doing enough testing as we speak. We're not unusual in that. Um, and as I said, even in the UK, it's far less ubiquitous for people to be tested. The US is actually doing a better job of testing at the moment. Um, but that certainly uh, that that confuses the numbers, and that's why we keep on focusing on the death numbers because there at least we have some degree of verification, and hence we're building all of these models off the death numbers, which does then mean that if the underlying IFR changes, if the mortality rate is coming down, it changes the numbers. The models need to be interpreted in a different way. But that's that sort of detail. That's uh, that's for the number crunches like us to worry about. But I think basically the bottom line is that we try and adjust for different testing practices by concentrating on the death numbers and trying to do the modeling of that. Yeah. But it's generally the true to say that the more testing, the better. It just gives you more information. You, you know how to deal with it. You can see where the hot spots are. So the more the testing, the better. But you know, the US president feels that uh, they, their numbers are where they are because they're doing too much of it. <laughs> anyway, I think the less we say about the US president, the better. I think, uh, <laughs> I think history will be a harsh judge of the strategy adopted there. And I mean, you can just look at Canada versus the US. Just look at it and see what, mm-hmm. how differently it's playing out there, both politically and actually on the ground, the number of people dying. Mm-hmm. So I think there's another interesting question here, uh, Emil, around uh, factoring um, new treatments, you know, effective treatments in, the, in, in your estimates for when you estimate your deaths. Um, do you factor that in to say if we were to find treatments that actually do work, this is what our projections would look like? Yes, yeah, so, we, so we're grappling with that question right at the moment. I think what it what it might give you the impression of initially when it starts happening is that the reproduction rate is falling because you're looking at the deaths to to derive the reproduction rate. Um, but either way, it's a good thing, you know, whether it's the reproduction rate falling or the or the infection fatality rate falling. We certainly see evidence of that, as I, as I explained. So, and it's already a material difference, um, and it still keeps on going down. So I think we might find in a week's time that it's 30% lower than what it was at the initial stages might go even further down. So I think any improvement in treatment basically helps us to manage the disease. I do think the one thing, um, and I'm I'm pretty sure that this audience is not really subject to that myth, but a lot of people said at the initial stages, actually, you know, this is not worse than seasonal flu. Mm -hmm. Every year there are people dying from flu. Um, But actually that's not the case. If you look at the numbers now, effectively, Already, it is uh, the, 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 the fact that it's so infectious, which means that so many people get infected, despite the fact that it has a low mortality rate of less than 0.4% in South Africa, still means that a lot of people die. And that's the thing with epidemics in general. The ones that have a very high mortality rate tend to have a much lower um, reproduction rate. Ebola is one of those. Um, The ones that have a a, a very high reproduction rate tend to have a lower mortality rate. Uh, If that was not the case, then we would all have been dead. So Mm -hmm. that's the way epidemics work out in general. Um, So, And this is one of those types of epidemics that has a very high rate of infection, a very high reproduction rate. So even though it has a low mortality rate per patient, it still has devastating consequences. And I mean, this 0.4 actually brings it much lower and even closer to the mortality rate that we see with flu, um, which yes. is now of around 0.1. So there's a question here that asks, what is the highest uh, in terms of risk at advanced age or deprivation? So uh, it's definitely both- age, okay. definitely age. Yeah. So when you look at, uh, the, the, I don't know if you recall, but, but for people at age 80 plus, 
definitely it has a much much higher rate than people below uh, 40 uh, very significantly so so unfortunately that is the way that it works so so one of the things to bear in mind is that and I think this is this is true for everybody on the call is just think about your families and if you have elderly parents in your families if you're older yourself all of those sort of things you, you people should just be much more careful um, and young people should be careful not to pass on the disease to older people. Um, I really do think that uh, with advanced age, it basically increases the risks very dramatically. Yeah. I think uh, this particular one is really very specific to, um, to physical activity. Um, and I think uh, there is a comment around, you know, gyms <laughs> that, that is counterproductive. And I think maybe we should just uh, put it out there that uh, you don't have to only be physically active in a gym environment. There's now physical activity at home. Vitality actually launched that uh, during lockdown. And I think um, the other issue is around, you know, exercising in large n enough numbers, but safely without access to, so activity reduce the admission risk. Then our challenge should be how to exercise in large enough numbers, but safely. So I think um, you know that is covered, um, you know, in in some of the exercise uh, at home uh, programs that uh, have been launched, not only maybe by Vitality, but um, I think uh, we can't uh, restrict physical activity to gyms. Um, there is a, another question around forecasting uh, the mortality based on the formula. Uh, where they're saying you talk or, to a death or recovery rate, how does the access to effective, oh, so th this one was covered. Oh, this is very important uh, around testing, um, um, Emil, there were two questions around uh, one, firstly, looking at our PCR as our gold standard uh, test, and also the fact that there is a degree of false negatives, uh, you know, and some people may also be asymptomatic and not test. So how does this uh, get factored into your numbers? Sure. So there's uh, there's lots of debates. Let me talk about the asymptomatic rate first. Um, there's a lot of speculation. There were studies done, especially initially on the Diamond Princess and some of those uh, those cruise ships um, coming out with saying that you know 70 or 80 or 90 percent of people actually had no symptoms. The problem with most of those studies, um, and it's very evident when you compare it against a study that came out of Italy um, this week, actually. Um, is that you have to follow it longitudinally. You have to give it enough time for people to develop symptoms. You can't just take a snapshot and say, do you, do you have any symptoms or have you had any symptoms? Because they might develop it two or three days later. So I think in any population, one has to give it enough time to get a true um, asymptomatic rate. The study out of Italy showed that about 45% of people were asymptomatic. Um, and that, to a large extent, is the problem of the disease. Close to half of people don't even know that they have it, and yet they're spreading it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that it is 70 or 90 percent, and I'll tell you why. If you look at a place like Australia, where, where you have um, basically the epidemic going up rapidly, contact tracing being in place, so everybody that tests positive, through mobile phones, they trace every other person that has been in contact with that person, they tell them to quarantine at home, and the police actually checks that you are at home. I know because my brother lives there. So basically it is enforced. As a result of that, you get the epidemic going down basically to close to zero. Now, out of all of the people tested in Australia, and out of all of the people that's confirmed infected, we have an IFR that is close to, or a case fatality rate that is close to the IFR. It's about 1.4% if I remember correctly, expected IFR for Australia is 0.9. Now, what that tells you is that if it was true that there's actually a whole lot of people who just, who are infectious, but asymptomatic, and yet they don't get tested, um, they would walk around and spread the, the virus all around them, you know, literally 10 times as many people would still be spreading the virus. That would mean that the infections and the deaths would not come down. So if you look at the countries that have managed it well and have gone basically through the wave and come down back to, to zero, they don't find that that many people are asymptomatic. And for that reason, the sort of argument is that, that people use to say that actually there are so many more people that have had it, we shouldn't worry, it's basically all over. That's not true in my view. I think. Mm 
So I think the asymptomatic uh, percentage is important, but in our numbers, basically what we're concentrating on is the infection fatality rate and the deaths. And whether people are asymptomatic or, or not doesn't really affect these numbers. Um, it would affect the herd immunity threshold if a lot more people were infected than we thought, but the numbers just don't seem to support that. Um, it, it appears that uh, in your slides, um, there was a number that you quoted in terms of the number of cases in South Africa that was 84,000. Um, and people are, are commenting on the fact that we are sitting at over 224,000 uh, cases already. So they wanted to know uh, what date was that, that you were uh, uh, I That's think I made a mistake. I don't I, I didn't update it. In the, in the rest of that table, it's correct, but I missed that number, so I apologize about that. I, I used 224 in the rest of the calculation, but uh, that was in just a mistake. It was a few weeks ago. No worries. I want to just, uh, for those people who joined late, uh, we do understand that there were some technical uh, difficulties, so we apologize uh, in advance, and uh, in fact, we apologize after the effect because we were not aware that uh, there were there was some of those challenges. Uh, but uh, maybe just to introduce uh, Emil again, um, Emil is an actuary, uh, head actuary at Discovery, um, the leading uh, actuarial work both in our local and international businesses. So Emil uh, is very knowledgeable about numbers, but uh, he's not a clinician. I see there are some questions up, uh, that are uh, relatively clinical on symptoms. I think some of those, um, we can answer them. I mean, diarrhea has been reported, reported as one of the symptoms. Um, it's also uh, important to just uh, touch on the vaccines, uh, BCG and pneumococcal. Um, even though, you know, there were some, um, there are some publications out there, but we still are looking for sufficient evidence uh, for those. Just one last question, maybe from my side, um, Emil, uh, your thoughts around the fact that, you know, uh, Asian countries uh, with prior exposure to SARS and MERS, um, you know, there have been some, some you know, thoughts around uh, them maybe having some level of immunity um, from those uh, infections. And therefore, what we are seeing there may not necessarily be uh, attributed to only some of the, you know, like social distancing and masks. I know most of us, well, I mean, I, we don't know yeah. much about it, but I mean, there have been some reports around that. Any thoughts? Yes, I don't think that that's true for the very simple reason that both of both SARS and MERS was very much contained in, the, in those outbreaks. I was actually in Hong Kong in 2003 um, when, uh, when SARS was particularly heavy there. The thing about SARS is that it had a much higher mortality rate than COVID. Um, and it was less infectious, but it was also contained within the population. So I don't believe that people generally had the exposure. And that means that effectively, mm -hmm. this is a novel coronavirus. Nobody has resistance to it. That's why it's so devastating. So I don't think that that exposure actually really makes a difference. What really makes a difference in Asia is the fact that they apply contact tracing and social distancing. Um, mm -hmm. Some of our colleagues living in China, as you may know, we have operations in China with Ping on Health. They're telling us, so the way that people live in, in Shanghai or in Beijing is that blocks of flats are grouped together. It's called a compound. So what happens with the contact tracing apps, you don't have a, a choice. You have to have this app on your mobile phone. When you go home in the evening, at the entrance to the compound, they check whether you have a green, amber, or red rating. If you have a red rating, it means that you were in contact with somebody that was tested um, COVID positive in the last day. You don't even get a choice. It's not as if you go home then. You basically get taken right there and taken to an isolation facility. Because of that, they managed to contain the disease. So even now, I think it was about two weeks ago, there was an outbreak again, um, and yet again it was contained. That's what Australia is trying to do now. Because the infection rate generally is so low, um, because it has been brought under control, it's still possible. In South Africa, in the UK, almost any other country in the world, where there's community transmission, you basically everybody has to go into complete lockdown again. And that's just not feasible economically, I think. Um, and that's why you find in Asia generally it's managed so well. Yeah. Um, the, the, there are some questions around um, higher risk with well-controlled diabetics and asthmatics. 
Um, and we know children in general dis display mild symptoms. Any statistics on children actually spreading COVID? I mean, that uh, I don't know that uh, you will see in our data. Uh, we don't have uh, many of those. And I think the data that's out there has, uh, has indicated that, uh, you know, it is not a well-known or well-documented fact that uh, kids are, you know, the ones who are spreading the infections as was thought before. Um, I yeah, think just, just quickly on that, uh, Norley, maybe just to mention, I think, uh, I think our own data shows, from what we can tell, um, the infection rate between children and adults is about 12.5%, and between mm -hmm. adults and adults is 13.5%. So it's no mm -hmm. real material difference. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some studies initially, I think about a month and a half ago, out of the Netherlands, showing that children don't infect adults. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to be supported by the data. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a question around antibody testing. Um, I think they were uh, the question was around antibody testing and the quality of the test. I think maybe just a, some feedback to the participants. We are aware that. Um, the, the National uh, Pathology Group, uh, I think they've submitted um, about three tests and they are evaluating two more, about five test kits uh, that they would like uh, to use in South Africa. So they are waiting SAPRA approval at this point. Um, so in, 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 a, in a couple of weeks, we are expecting South Africa to be able to also do um, antibody testing. What we are still uh, obviously un, unclear about is the yeah. positioning of the care. Um, as you know, they are currently not used in acute, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the acute illness itself. So I think that we will all wait patiently to see uh, once they are registered and the positioning in care. Um, um, I think we would, we'll have to come uh, to, to, to bring this to a close. I would like to really thank, um, you know, Emil for sharing, um, you know, all these uh, data insights. I think people really appreciated this. And for those who would like to see um, this presentation, those who joined later, uh, this is available on the Discovery website under, you know, the tab uh, for health, uh, healthcare professionals. So you can still be able to view this uh, webinar. We thank you for joining us uh, this evening. And thank you so much, uh, Emil, for spending the time with us. Um, enjoy the UK. Um, yeah, I think it's warmer than here. So we are experiencing maybe our winter could be actually similar to your to your summer there, but uh, please do enjoy the warmth. And uh, there is a poll here, we would like people to just uh, assist uh, with uh, completing it so that we get a sense of how they've enjoyed the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us um, and have a good, a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Nolu. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you.